Yes. Yesterday I was in Washington. From his home in Walpole, New Hampshire, filmmaker and producer Ken Burns discusses making the Civil War. Here now is media critic and host Ron Powers. This has been a painful couple of hours, yeah. Ken. We've seen the suffering. We've seen the agony. We've seen the torture of this war that somehow is rarely in capsuled in the myths, in the romantic renderings yes. of this. We see, for instance, the, the slaughter of those 300 black soldiers at Fort Pillow after they had surrendered. We sometimes forget that black men lived and died in this war as Put well as being one of the blue uniforms causes. to yes. fight under white officers. It's, yes. it's, a, it's a colorful story. Um, we do forget that, and a very important part is the contribution of blacks. Not merely were they involved in the early episodes in promoting emancipation, but then in extraordinary percentages fought to free their people uh, and dispelled a myth that they would be ineffective fighters. In fact, uh, as heroic of fighters there were. Uh, in 1863, we saw the doomed charge at Battery Wagner that was made into the movie Glory. Yes. Uh, Frederick Douglass's son, Lewis, and William Carney, the first black to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, fought there. Uh, this is one of the most dramatic and, I think, great stories in our history. We should be teaching our children this, along with the Robert E. Lees and the Ulysses S. Grant. 64 is difficult. This is hard to take. This is the, war, the year of the war which you wish you could take up and out and go from Gettysburg to 1865 and have it end quickly. Um, it, it is um, about slaughter, the likes of which we have never seen before. Battles are no longer one or two day affairs. They last for weeks. The fighting really doesn't stop. Uh, we have trench warfare. Um, this year hurts. It really hurts, in a way, uh, for me. Very painful to consider the most difficult episodes to edit, too. Well, I was going to ask you about that, Ken. I mean, you, it took you five years to complete this series. That is one more year, if I'm not mistaken, than it took to fight the Civil War. Yes. What kind Only slightly of... fewer casualties. Yes. <laughs> How did the accumulated suffering and the accumulated sorrow of the Civil War began to play on your psyche and the psyches of the people in your enclave. And how did you keep up your sense of, of an aesthetic mission? I tell you how we did. We kept going and working on early episodes, too. Uh, we, we edited it as a piece, so we we're constantly going over the whole thing. This was the difficult stuff. I'm particularly pleased with episode six and how it turned out. That begins with Grant, goes to Lee, then sets them in motion in the wilderness, yes. Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, culminates with uh, just a excruciatingly painful section on hospital, and then says, what is the remedy to this? William Tecumseh Sherman. Then we go to the last half of the year in the most hallowed ground, and things are getting bad. It's trenches, it's the crater, it's the Fort the Pillow crater. slaughter, it's Nathan Bedford Forest. It's this excruciating irony that ends this year that Robert E. Lee's home is now the site, uh, the burial site, the final resting place of the men who had been sent to fight him. It's so obvious. It was like the nose on my face, and suddenly we just woke up to it. The most hallowed ground of the Union, the Union's yes. most hallowed ground, is Robert E. Lee's front lawn. But there's another piece of ground that has tremendous resonance, and that is that crater, that horrible misbegotten blast and, and the needless slaughter that resulted from it. I suppose if there's one episode that sums up the futility of, of, of war this. and resonates really into the 20th century, yes. it's the crater. It's the crater and Andersonville. Yeah. Uh, do we not hear in Henry Wirtz, the German Swiss commandant, in the excuses given to the deaths at Andersonville, in the way these men looked, a sort of early nightmarish vision of what the 20th century would begin to offer in terms yeah. of warfare. Uh, this is the year of the war. Everyone wishes to forget, but we can't forget. So those 130 years that we've talked about on previous nights begin to collapse a little bit, don't they? begin they? to it, collapse. The war doesn't seem that long ago. In Sherman's brilliance, and we have to acknowledge, you know, Sherman is a very important character in this war, brilliant, and he has been heaped with so much opprobrium by the South, and one understands why, that we've allowed their hatred to determine the agenda 
on William Tecumseh Sherman. We cannot. This is a brilliant, superbly brilliant man that changes the face of war for all times. Um, and yet, what does he change it to in terms of making war on civilian populations and property? Um, this is the story getting more difficult to take yes. and as we see it develops as his march begins in the next episode and we see the terrible toll there um, war is changing for good not just the American Civil War but war for all time this was a big war um, you say yourself that it had a thousand mile front it extended well up into New England even up into the northern part of Vermont into St. Albans troops coming down from Canada in 64 uh, several southern agents uh, raided St. Albans, Vermont, uh, came over the border from Canada, which had a lot of southern activity, um, a lot of diplomats and, and spies and agents moving freely within Canada, as Canada had also offered the haven at the end of the Underground Railroad leading up to the Civil War. Um, they came over, attacked St. Albans, hoping to take its treasure away, assuming that the staid New Englanders would put up no fight. They brought with them vials of Greek fire, a sort of hang grenade, a sort of bomb which you threw and would explode, hoping to terrorize the taciturn New Englanders. It didn't work. We fought back nobly and bravely, captured a few of them. It was not a success. Uh, Southerners also tried to set half of New York on fire, as we yeah, yeah. point out. That memory, by the way, is very much alive in St. Albans to this day, isn't it? You bet. Uh, we begin our series. The first real voices of the narrator said the Civil War was fought in 10,000 places from Valverde, New Mexico and Tullahoma, Tennessee to St. Albans, Vermont and Fernandina yes. on the Florida coast. Yes. 10,455 places to be precise. Yes. Um, and we have to emphasize, though the photographic record supports that everything seemed to have happened in Virginia and Pennsylvania and Tennessee, it did happen in New Mexico, yeah. in Vermont, uh, and in countless other places, Arkansas. Yes. Amazing story. We Northerners uh, lack the sort of sense of the immediacy of the war. Being we, invaded. Being the invaders, being the victors, we went on to other business. So the sense of defeat didn't stay with us. But it's great to have a battle we can call our own. Right. <laughs> I'd like for you to talk a bit about the grand resolution that you have built into these last episodes. You have tied up the Civil War not only in terms of the generals, the statesmen, the assassination of Lincoln and the aftermath politically and culturally, but you've tied up the individual stories of all the characters who have guided us through these episodes. Tell me about that and tell us the function of that effort on your part. 1865, the two episodes, War is All Hell, and then the better angels of our nature are the two episodes. They are the end of the war. Not just the end of the war, but a consideration of what the war did to the country. We found out that we had become so interested in the people we had introduced ourselves to, introduced you to, that we had to find out what happened to them. So we spend a good deal of time in the last episode literally ranging well into the 20th century to consider the fates of many of the people that you've gotten to know, that you care about, Elisha and Sam, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, even Washington Roebling, um, Abraham Lincoln, all of the people in tragic, in funny, in poignant ways, how the Civil War made us the country that we are today. So often when we consider the Civil War in history, we're taught causes and then we leapfrog the actual event and are told the effects. Uh, from Reconstruction on. It was our mission in this story to tell what happened in between those causes and those effects, something that people seem strangely disinterested in, except for the buffs, except for the reenactors. Um, as a country, we need to know why we murdered 620,000 of our own people who prayed to the same God, who spoke the same language, who cared about the same things. Uh, how this could have happened in a country, a beautiful, exquisite agricultural country of 31 million in 1861. Everything was now different. Um, we were uh, the same and we were not the same. And that is what these last two terribly poignant, I believe, emotionally draining episodes are about. How 
this civil war changed us forever. Wasn't it Shelby Foote who made the observation that the civil war changed us from saying the United States are to the United States is? This is the story. All of these evenings have been the story of how we've become an is. Um, there's good news, too, uh, in all of this. Uh, we can hear one of the great speeches again spoken by Abraham Lincoln, the second inauguration, the malice towards none speech. We can see the magnanimity at, at Appomattox of the combatants and meet old friends and go home again. That's always good news, to go yes. home again. Yes. And as we go home, I, I'd like to just take a moment to extend my appreciation and my admiration to you for being a part of this and for doing the wonderful thing that you've done. When you speak of a Ken Burns film, it is very nice to say all of these thanks to me, but a Ken Burns film is really many, many people, particularly Jeffrey Ward, uh, the principal writer and my chief collaborator over the last several years. Uh, my brother Rick, who served as the co-producer with me on this, uh, David McCullough is the narrator, all of the voices, Paul Barnes, the editor, the principal editor, who had to keep all of this together. So I accept your thanks on behalf of all of those people who, who seem to now be under this umbrella called a Ken Burns film. It is for all of them. Thank you.